Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Glad you could join me in our weekly adventure into the uplands, uh, into the dog kennels, uh, and onto the training yard. All of those things we'll cover today, and some hunting strategies that, well, I think it's about time we take a look at some of this stuff. Uh, stealth. I know, I know, if you're a turkey hunter or a elk hunter, whitetail hunter in particular, you probably know a little bit more about that than most, but you know, I've hit on this in the last few months at how important stealth is to an upland bird hunter. And I started compiling notes and observations from all the experts in that world that I know, including some elk hunters who I will share their thoughts, their strategies, some of the tips they use, some of the things I've learned. So if you want to be a better bird hunter, shut the heck up. That's one of the tips right there. Of course, we got lots more to talk about, including some images and videos of some of your special places I asked on uh, on one of the Facebook pages uh, to share some of that stuff. So we'll, we'll take a little bit of a tour of some of your favorite places. We'll also have the Upland Nation Glossary. We're on the letter M there. And of course, another public access opportunity for you in one of my favorite places. So yeah, I'm going to share one of mine. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast. So stick around. Well, I've been working hard with Flick on a couple things that are related. And, and in fact, I, I had a, a, a revelation on this one. Maybe you're at the same point in your dog training. You know, dogs, especially if you're working with, uh, you know, pen-raised birds, domesticated birds, birds in launchers or otherwise, um, you know, kept from flying like a wild bird would. Flick starts to creep up a little bit on those birds. He'll also, he hits a point eventually, but at sometimes he just does it a little too soon. And that becomes, I mean, not a little too soon, a little too late. You know, he'll get up right into that bush. Uh, most of the time I hide the launchers pretty well, but he'll get up right into that bush before he stops. And then he'll hold it, and he'll hold it for a good long time. But he doesn't respect the scent cone so we're working on that a lot and i got some great advice uh, from an article a friend of mine sent me a training buddy sent me a a, a couple weeks ago from uh i think it was from mo lindley um and ironically um he was just right on when it came to my situation. So now I'm putting those pigeons into the launcher and making sure that I'm watching Flick very carefully when I guide him, if you will, direct him into the scent cone. If he hits the point immediately, then he immediately gets a flying bird and then ultimately a retrieve. If he doesn't, the bird goes up, that in itself, he knows, means freeze, steady to flush, even a wild flush, but he doesn't get a retrieve out of it. So we quickly come back around, do it again, so that he puts two and two together and gets four instead of three and a half or seven. And it works pretty well. I'm really impressed with this idea. So I'm going to keep doing it. So far, so good. You know, the last 10 times we've done it, He's been good nine of them. I'll take that percentage any day. If I was batting 900 back in the day, well, I wouldn't be talking to you here. I'd be signing autographs somewhere. Anyway, food for thought. When you're working on your dog roading in, definitely worth considering. Yeah, time for our public access uh, with a topic, I guess I'll call it. I'm I'm sharing these things with you because I do want you to go. I want you to take advantage of some of the opportunities out there and and I'd love to have you join me. Of course, the first place to join me would be here on South Dakota for our Fur Feathers Friends gathering this October. Learn more at furfeathersfriends.com and how you might be able to do that or do it on your own. Just take a buddy hunting. This week, 
I'm going to spill the beans on one of my favorite Montana locations, Lewistown, Montana, smack dab in the center of the state, kind of east of Great Falls, and one of those places that uh, once you've been there, you want to go back. Yeah, got a little craft brewery now, some pretty good restaurants. I've always had a good time, but more importantly, it is the core of a lot of that great block management access land that Montana does such a good job with. You know, the difference with their walk-in program is landowners only get paid when you go there and have a good time. If the habitat's crappy or you don't go because you already know that, well, they don't get paid. That's why they have a sign-in kiosk at almost every one. Some require a reservation, a phone call, or even stopping in. But most of them, you just drive over, sign in, leave half the card in the box, and go hunting. And a great place to do that is in the 50 or so miles circling Lewistown, Montana. Vast ranch lands with huns and sharp tails, some river bottoms with pheasants. They're all accessible right there near Lewistown, Montana. Do your homework, get the map book for Region 5, and then make sure you follow directions in terms of uh, how you um, make a reservation if you need to, or um, certain places are open certain times a year, that sort of thing. Just make sure you're following the rules, and then put it on your cell phone and, and use the mobile version of that uh, map book as well. Hey, the Upland Nation is brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, crafted at the highest caliber. Something new always coming down the road from Fred Bohm and everybody at sageandbreaker.com. Go to that website, sign up for the mailing list. You'll get the first alert on all of the new products and the rare sales that take place at sageandbreaker.com. Anything you need to take care of your shotguns, your handguns, your long guns, he's got it, including a great set of videos. I learn something every time I watch. sageandbreaker.com. Com. And LegacySports.com is where you learn more about all the pointer shotguns. Just shot a video with one of my new pointer Acreus over and unders. More to come in that regard. In fact, there's a couple with Cerakoted finishes in kind of cool colors. Just waiting for me to get over to my FFL and pick them up. If you'd like to learn more about what's available in the pointer shotgun line, go to LegacySports.com slash pointer there's a 2022 catalog available online you can get a look at all the guns semis over and unders youth guns high-end entry-level target field and like i said all those cerakote finishes in pretty cool colors all available at legacysports.com well I promised we would talk about some of the things I've learned over the years about stealth and how important it is to bird hunters. A lot of this really kind of came to the fore as I was chucker hunting with a good friend of mine who's also a avid, in fact, he's on a bear hunt right now. He's an avid big game hunter and uh, some of the things he does and some of the things he says just got this kind of idea going in my head. And so I started putting all these ideas together into a list. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on this stuff. And if you have any more thoughts on this topic, I'd love to hear them. But here's a good starting point for anybody who wants to put one more pheasant in their vest the next time they're out there or wants to get just a little closer to that hinky covey of Hungarian partridge. And I say those because that's exactly when all of this comes down to the wire. Where the rubber meets the road is when you're walking along a fence row or you're climbing a hill and and the birds are getting up wild because you've done something and you didn't even know about it. Yeah, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Now, Flick, he's pretty good, and he's pretty steady, and he was way out. It was about 390 yards, I believe, um, but I was below him, and, and Tom was above him, and uh, 
we were both kind of side hilling in chucker country and uh and i saw flick on point tom couldn't see him so tom's just walking along and if you're walking side hills in chucker country you know it's it's not a very stealthy process it's it it's really noisy you know there's loose rocks you're skidding on the sand you're pushing your way through thickets of sagebrush it's all happening uh not just tom but me but when i saw flick go on point i tried to be just a little bit very a little bit more quiet than usual it it, it worked but not well enough because i couldn't yell at tom and ask him to be quiet and point to where the birds might be and no matter how many frantic hand signals i gave him he was in the wrong place at the wrong time so I kept going up the hill trying to catch, you know, kind of the, 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 the intersection of all of our trajectories and the birds at the same time. Luckily, when those chuckers did fly wild, because they were scared by both of us, uh, Flick hadn't pushed them. No, we had. Uh, one of them flew my direction, and yeah, hey, I scored finally for a change. That, I think that was the only bird I shot on that hunt, by the way. And by the way, thank you, David and Tiffany, for letting us access that place through your place. Uh, that was just one more example of how uh, stealth is not just for whitetail hunters. Uh, so, you know, if you want to shoot more birds over your dog's point or even a flushing breed, you know, you got to get in close on a lot of that. The problem is we often sound, you know, like the circus parade that used to happen in small towns. They'd offload the train, the elephants could go last, you know why. But everybody else is making as much noise as they can because they want everybody to come to the circus later that night. We scare away a lot of birds. We may not know it, but we scare away a lot of birds. I was reminded of that hunting with my buddy Al Gadori in Lewistown, Montana. Uh, hey, in fact, Tom was on that trip too. I got to get out more. Anyway, um, we we pushed our way through a sagebrush uh, slope, a uh, nice gradual slope. We were looking for sharp tails and, uh, and nothing, nothing. Two dogs, good dogs, nothing. We turned around at the end of that push and there goes two or three birds out the other side, way out there, you know, 800 yards from where we were standing at the moment, who had heard us coming, hooked back, gotten out of the way, hunkered down, and waited till we pass, and then hightailed it the other direction and got out of there. Yeah, they can be as spooky as a wild turkey. You may not see their ears, but they do have some, and they're acutely aware of predators, all predators their actions and the sounds they make. So remember that. Birds do listen. They may not use their ears as uh, much as they use their eyes, but they do use them. So here are some of the lessons I've learned right after a sip of coffee. Ugh, made it myself. First thing, stuff a sock in it. Uh, many, many years ago i was walking a canyon in a little quail hunt that i do once or twice a year and uh the batteries on on uh, buddy's collar at the time they just crapped out so i had i had no beeper i had no gps and uh, he didn't have any tags on me because i had a beeper collar on him all of a sudden the quiet was almost deafening it was magical in a way, and you know, it was a nice day. The sun was on the junipers, so they were wafting that scent that some people hate and some people love. There was melted snow on the ground, so you could smell that, you know, the water and the earth mixed together. It's a, it's a great place to be when your senses are heightened by the lack of listening. Or heightened listening. Yeah. You know, you just have to be more careful and you have to be more strategic about what you're listening for, including your dog and where he's running, panting. Sometimes the loudest noise in that canyon was Buddy panting. But what it did was it reminded me that if you can get just a few steps closer to that mountain quail covey, you might actually get a shot. 
And that was pretty cool. In fact, I did put one mountain quail in the bag. And you know, it flew out of a covey that was almost all valley quail. This happens to be a lot. I've snuck really close to birds just by being more careful about how I walk. I take the collar tags off the dog's collar whenever I can. And sometimes I'll just go unplugged altogether. Won't use an electric collar of any any sort. Even the little, uh, what do they call it, the tone sound on some of those will scare birds depending on how hard they've been hunted or how late in the year it is or all of that. You know, walk carefully through the brush. Don't bulldoze through it. Choose your footfalls just a little bit more carefully and you might get another step or two or ten on a covey or a wary ringneck pheasant. Oh, and by the way, everybody knows when you're starting a bird hunt not to slam your truck doors, right? Okay, got it. I'm Scott Linden, uh, the note taker in chief here at the Upland Nation podcast. A lot of these lessons have been taught to me over the years, not only by people, but by dogs who have their own way of dealing with stealth. Plan ahead. This is the big game hunters, Bailiwick, and they do it all the time. How many big game hunters do you know? Maybe you're one of them who subscribes to one of those online mapping apps, you know, the mobile apps. Well, that's one way to do it. I like paper maps, too. They're just old school and kind of cool to have on the walls. But if you're, no matter how you're looking at them, satellite images, uh, topographical maps, it doesn't matter. You plot and you plan online or, you know, on the kitchen table after dinner. Scouting for ideal habitat, looking for water features, yeah, for us too, and terrain that might favor birds. You know your birds, you know where they want to go, but when you are sitting in your living room, are you looking for those kind of places? Well, do a little bit more of that <laughs> and at least put a few marks on the map at places you haven't been, but you think look birdy for one reason or another. Another good friend of mine always carries binoculars. Yeah, to me, it's another pound and a half to carry in your vest, and I'd, I'd rather bring that much more water. And luckily, he's usually with me with his binoculars, so it works out pretty well for both of us. But that way, those mirages in the distance can be sussed out slightly. Are they really dips in the landscape, or is there a creek bottom there, or is that just a dark piece of brush? All those things. And I've started doing more of it as well. These days, while it's not 100% accurate, you can go on some of those uh, mobile mapping apps and find guzzlers. And in chucker country, Nevada in particular, for example, I spent a couple nights looking for guzzlers in some of the places that nobody else could get to. I mean, God bless them. The Nevada Chucker Foundation puts guzzlers in the most remote locations they use helicopters and thank you for that too guys and if you want to find those and i'll never set up at a guzzler in fact i've never found one but i found the general location which is good enough in some of that country after all it's a desert and the only water source around is worth scouting best opener ever Later that season, best closer. We went up and over the top, down to the other end of a massive chasm that should be a national park. And uh, shot chuckers on flat ground, found valley quail just downstream from them. Yes, because we did find a little creek as well. All of that because we spent a little bit of time looking at the mobile mapping app and all the satellite images that came with it. Now, you rough grouse hunters, you're, you're, you've been doing this for years, uh, and you know whether it was a paper map or some of these online versions of it now, there's some great services out there that will show you all the burns, timber cuts, all the prime cover, including 
the age of a lot of that stuff. So if you haven't invested in that service, it will be worth your time and your money. My only caution, and I learned this the hard way, all those mobile mapping apps have some lag time between, for example, when a walk-in property comes on the program and when it actually ends up on the map. Public agencies are notorious for taking their time about updating their versions of the map, which is where Onyx and all those other guys gets their data. Uh, we searched long and hard one time in Northeast Oregon for a walk-in spot. We Ultimately, we found it only because uh, we asked a trapper who was packing up for the day, and he said, yeah, it's right over there. In fact, I'll take you there. It's my place. Nobody had it on their maps, but we had heard rumor about it, so we searched and searched and searched, and uh, finally, with that much work, pulled it off. But the problem had been it was not on on X yet. In fact, even the local game biologists didn't even know it was in the walk-in program yet. So take all that data with a grain of salt. As Ronald Reagan said a long time ago, trust but verify. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this stealthy approach to bird hunting. Is that an oxymoron or what? No. And let's not go to the moron place. Sure appreciate your attention. Let me remind you that the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by audiocardio.com. You know, it'll improve your situational awareness when you're being stealthy out there hunting. You'll listen more carefully because you'll have two better ears than you had before. How much more stealthy can you get? Well, try the audiocardio.com hearing wellness app. Yep, load it onto your phone. Just plug your earbuds in every day. Go about your normal activities. Uh, it does basically what I will call physical therapy for your ears. There's a 14-day free trial. After that, if you feel you need it, it can be as low as 8.33 a month. Watch the two-minute video at audiocardio.com. And welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. The eyes have it. Or the hands do, one or the other. If you're not using hand signals and being more, um, I guess I'll call it quieter and nonverbal, especially communicating with your dogs, let alone with your hunting buddies, well, you're probably missing birds. It's happened to me a million times. I've got well, a, a, a small vocabulary of hand signals, so... Uh, Sometimes you have to be quiet, not only because you're trying to get closer to birds and maybe a dog on point on birds, but because you're in a test that requires it. You can't handle the dog. You can't hack a dog, for example, in the NAVDA tests, uh, whether it's a dead bird search or a duck search or anything else. After you cast the dog for that retrieve, all you can do is face in the direction you want that dog to go. And it works. I've forgotten who told me this many years ago. I will remember. His, oh, no, I do remember. Phil Swain, who you heard on a podcast just a while back. Phil reminded me many, many years ago that um, dogs key in on your face. It's, it's often the lightest thing in their field of vision. And they want to, a well-bred dog wants to be in front of you, working in front of you for the birds because they want to, frankly, get them before you do. So if a dog can see your face and know which direction you're going, they're going to get up there. So use your face, even a face like mine for radio, use it to your advantage by looking in the direction you want to go, let alone you want the dog to search if you're doing a dead bird retrieve or something like that. It just might help. 
like I said, I have a few formal hand signals, not many because, uh, uh, you know, from a distance, especially, it's a little hard for a dog to make out some of that stuff. So they have to be big motions and motion is the key. A veterinary ophthalmologist about four dogs ago reminded me that dogs, like most predators, see moving objects better than they see stationary objects. I see it once a week in the front yard. The gray squirrel is nibbling on a pine cone trying to get all those bitter pine nuts out of it into his nest. My dog is sleeping in the grass. Nothing's happening until the squirrel heads for his tree. That motion is enough to set off the predator in Flick and all of a sudden Katie bar the door. The rodeo starts and it only ends after about four minutes of looking lovingly into the tree hoping that that big piece of furry prey comes back down. So use some motion in your hand signals, just a little or just a lot, depending on how far away your dog is and how carefully you've taught that stuff. Motion is good most of the time. I've also developed a little bo vocabulary of tones from my e-collar. The beep, of course, if, if you're trying to be stealthy, you're not going to use that beep. It's really loud, although some people do for various things and more power to you if you can get away with it. But I'll use that tone for a couple things. I use it to ask Flick to change direction. I usually accompany it with a at least a facing that direction or I will, you know, hand sig signal him that way. Some people will use the vibration feature as well, and that, that works pretty well for me as well. For me, it's usually just a reminder, hey, pay attention and look at me, and it does work. So just remember, you can't see their ears, but birds have them, and if you're a turkey hunter, you probably learned that the hard way. I've learned it the hard way with everything from huns and mountain quail to sharp tails and sage grouse. Looking at all of them squeeze out the other way after they heard us crashing into the field, clanking gear, whistles and yelling and uh, everything else. So um, we're getting uh, pretty deep into the stealth thing. We got a lot more to cover in this regard, but I also have some other things I'd love to cover with you, including our Upland Nation glossary. We're going to the letter M and your pictures and videos about that special place. So um Stick around after this commercial message. For RoughlandKennels.com, and remember, Flick was probably the brand image director when they spelled it, R-U-F-F, Land Kennels, RoughlandKennels.com. That way your dog can recognize it as well. I was reminded again this morning, putting some stuff in Flick's kennel in the back of my truck i did i was lazy didn't want to put the tailgate down but i could still reach one of the releases on one of the doors that will open in either direction man how convenient is that when you're you know dealing with a very crowded pickup truck bed for example or your dog is coming from the front of the bed instead of the back of the bed open that door from either direction Direct your dog in, pull your dog's bowl out, whatever it is, it's all much simpler when you have a door that will open in both directions. Let alone two doors, one on the side and one on the end. R-U-F-F landkennels.com. Roughlandkennels.com. And welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here sharing some of the things I've learned from people much smarter and quite often better looking than me about stealth. I know. Bird hunting? Stealth? What the heck? But it's true. If you can be just a little more careful on your bird hunts, you might put one more Bob White in your bag. Got a downside to that? I don't think so. Okay, I learned this one on a slope. That I hope I never go back there. 
but I will because there were so many cubbies. We're um, side hilling above a dry lake that had had water in it the last time I was there. That's how bad the drought is this year. Anyway, we were up, you know, probably a thousand feet above that dry lake bed and going sideways looking for chuckers again. And every few hundred yards, a whole covey would get up in front of us. We could never get close enough to those birds. Never. Here's why. The dogs were. They were getting closer and closer and closer. By the time we got there, the dogs had pushed the birds. The birds had freaked out. The, the birds had hurt us. Whatever it was. But mainly it was the dogs were getting there before us. And these old baseball catcher knees simply couldn't get there in time. So if you've been stealthy and you've done your planning and you've looked at the terrain, you probably have a pretty good idea of where those birds are hunkering nearby. Keep your dog in close, whether it's at heel or you got another command. I got one I call close. And he stays, you know, spaniel range for me until I cut him loose. I cut him loose only when we're in that birdie pocket. In this case, it was a big gash in a lava slope. It had juniper trees on both sides, but the bottom of this chasm was rocks and sagebrush and a little bit of bunch grass. And sure enough, that's where the birds were. They were on the south-facing slope trying to thaw out after a cold night. And we just kept our dogs tight until we were right over it. Send the dogs in. They do their job the right way. Hopefully, they pin those birds. We can get down to them a little bit easier than we can get up to them. And then we missed. But the lesson sunk in. Keep your dog close on the really wild birds, the hard-pressured birds, the birds that are in weird places that may not feel as secure as birds in their normal haunts. It works sometimes. Here's one when it did. Fent, Felton and I were, were on a spot, um, a big, long canyon, big desert canyon, classic classic Hungarian partridge country. And I, I think I told this story in, in, in at least some detail. Flick hits a point at 260 yards and he's, he's up the canyon from us, but luckily at about the same level. So all we got to do is side hill to him. And we're, we're doing that. And he, it turns out he's facing us as we're coming up the canyon. He's facing at us. And so, you know, we're looking at each other thinking, yeah, I get it. Um, and sure enough, they were between us and him, uh, upstream breeze and all that, up up canyon breeze. There, no, there was a stream at the bottom. But anyway, in that case, he was close enough to us when I turned him loose that he did a big swing through, came in, tightened up a little bit, and that was that. It worked because we kept him close until we got to the birdie spot. Now, the other reason to be a little bit more circumspect about the distance you allow your dog to cover is the sentinel birds that a lot of species will post. We all know about the uh, classic valley quail on the fence post, but a lot of other birds will do the same thing. I've never seen it in huns, but I, I'm convinced that there, there's always an outlier in a hun covey. There's always a bird that's 15 or 20 feet away from the rest of the covey. I think that's their job. Chuckers, they'll get up on a high spot. So a lot of times you'll see one bird skylined on a boulder of some sort. Okay, the rest of them are down there. While that one looks out for coyotes, hawks, human beings, stray cattle, doesn't matter. So the first thing you might want to do is, is take out your binoculars and see if you can find any of those sentinel birds. If you can, well, it's a pretty good indication there's birds right there. But how do you get to them? Now is when you get to recall all those fun games of what we used to call Big Army when we were kids. 
put the sneak on those birds. Keep something between you and them. Vegetation, topography, whatever it is. A lot of birds, the smartest thing to do is go all the way around, then go up and come at them from above. Most animals seldom look above as a threat. Uh, birds are better than most because a lot of their uh, pre predators are avian predators. But even still, if you can get above those birds, it gives you a, le pardon the pun, a leg up. The last valley quail I shot in one covey, uh, the boss bird was looking at the creek bottom below, not the hill that I'd just come around and over. It's hard enough for me, but downhill shots are the hardest of all. But I did score once that day on one of those shots. And it was very satisfying, believe me. Now, there's another good reason to do this, uh, get above the birds. Once the sun hits the ground in a lot of those uh, locations, the warm air rises. What's it going to bring with it when it's rising upslope? Yeah, that's right. Your dog appreciates it just as much as you do. Bird scent coming his way. So the bigger and final question in our exploration of stealth is, are you the problem? The, the quick and dirty answer is hell yes. Your dog easily can become a wraith in the field. Deal with the collar. He's following your nonverbal communications. He's light footed and just ghosting across the landscape. What about you? And I'll never forget, I, I was reading a mag. I read all the magazines cover to cover. I do, I really do, not just for my own byline. There's always something useful in those magazines, so do please subscribe. Anyway, there's an ad for, uh, in fact, I forgot what it was even for. It was for something, but it was one of those lumber sexual looking guys who really didn't know how to hold a shotgun, let alone anything else, and his brand new vest had six or seven things hanging from it, you know, look like a, you know, the old time gypsy wagon. Can I say gypsy anymore? I can. You got a problem with that? Take a number. Anyway, collar control, whistle, his, his cell phone, all that stuff hanging off the exterior of his vest. You think he ever killed a bird? Mm, probably not because they all heard him coming from a mile off. Don't be like that model. Stow your junk, turn off your phone, and be a little bit more circumspect about what the birds see and hear. Yeah, we've uh, just barely scratched the surface of stealth, and I'd love to keep talking about it, but you have other things that you'd rather do, including perhaps learn about the Upland Nation Glossary's M entries and also find out who's got a special place and what it looks like. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast, so stick around. We're brought to you in part by Dr. Tim's Natural Performance Dog Food. You know, he's got something for every life stage. There's treats, supplements, and toppers now as well. So no matter what your dog needs, if it's nutritional in nature, D-R-T-I-M-S dot com is where you find the products for your dog. You'll get free delivery right to your porch at whatever schedule you think is important and useful. 30% off your first order when you use the code Upland Nation. Learn more about why Tim Hunt sources the products he does and puts them in various formulations for all the right reasons at D-R-T-I-M-S dot com. And how do you search for the gun of your dreams? Well, these days, frantically, <laughs> you have supply chain issues, among other things. And then, man, if you find something you like, you better jump on it fast. Well, I got a better solution for you. MidValleyClays.com. That's the short version for the uh, website, but it's also Mid Valley Clays and Shooting School. And they ought to say, and 
we have a special relationship with all the major shotgun manufacturers. Sometimes Mid-Valley Clays can find a hard-to-find gun that's not available anywhere else. They have a whole bunch in stock, whether it's target or hunting-focused shotguns. You ought to take a look at them if you're searching for a new one right now. Learn more at midvalleyclays.com. Just click on the, uh, let's see what they call it, the Pro Shop, and take a look at their inventory. Talk to Dave Fiedler. Tell him what you're looking for. He can probably offer a few suggestions and probably pull something out of the safe and uh, send it along. All right, we're up to the Upland Nation Glossary. Thank you all for your suggestions. Get a lot of them for every letter, and I will incorporate them all in an upcoming version of that. It's available at findbirdhuntingspots.com. M, well, the most interesting one for a bunch of Uplanders might be Mark. (laughs) No, not the name. The first definition of a Mark is uh, the thing that falls to the ground that you're asking your retriever to get. So it could be a bumper. It could be a dummy of some sort. It could be a dead bird. You know, hey, throw the mark. Boom. Somebody does that. Retriever guys, you know what I'm talking about. The second, though, is the act of watching that item as it falls or or is being thrown. So your dog, you want your dog to mark the location. You want him to look at it. You want him to watch it as it falls down. For obvious reasons. Mark, one of the many, I had to do a list. No, how to count them. One of the many entries in the Upland Nation glossary. Find it at findbirdhuntingspots.com. And now we're up to my, what is becoming, quickly becoming my favorite part of the podcast. I ask a question on uh, on the Wing Shooting USA and the Upland Nation Facebook pages, and you answer it. And this is a good one. I I pulled out a picture of a, a camp I I spend some time at once in a while. So imagine imagine a big wall tent with a big chimney with some smoke coming out of it in a deep deep rocky canyon that by the way, also has a trout stream at the bottom of it. But this is a bird hunt, one of those rugged hunts in a rugged place that I love so much. When I'm there, we're usually doing it on horseback, which is even better because coming out of that canyon is a real challenge. Yeah. But it was inspiration for all of you to share your own images of your own special places and No, I'm sorry, there are no latitude and longitude for any of them, but they are great photos. David DeSmither shows me an image of rolling hills that just scream sharp tail. The grass is, I mean, it's endless. It is, uh, you know, like a Walt Whitman sea of grass, only it's a little taller, maybe knee high, which is classic bend in the wind kind of sharp tail territory. One dark shadow on one hill, but the rest of them just roll off into the haze of the distance. Man, I'd like to join you there sometime, David. So, um, no, he won't tell us. He says it's somewhere out west. That's it. Good friend of the podcast and training buddy, Eric Thompson, shows us a video. He's watering one of his beautiful wire-haired pointing griffons. Uh, There's a close-up of his... It must be cold because he's got fingerless ragwool gloves on. But, man, that dog is in such good shape. Is it a young dog, Eric, coming up for some water out of a water bottle? Looks familiar. We have the same vest. I know that's where it came from. Just come off a beautiful hunt in a beautiful place that, to a great degree, looks like a place I love for chucker hunting. He's at the top of a rounded hill, but in in the distance, I can see the other side of that canyon, and it's full of volcanic scree, that black, ruggedly um, jagged stuff that just screams chuckers. Dan Lenson shows me an arty photo of uh, some beautiful dark branches. Maybe you did something with the exposure there. Dark branches with... um, with a pile of those big hay bales 
in the distance. It's uh, it's it's pretty arty. I I hope you got that framed somewhere in your lodge or something. Jeff Hansen's got a golden retriever. It looks like in some uh, I think that's corn stubble. It's kind of hard to tell from here, but it's just a sta- uh, golden retriever standing still. Hey, wait, wait a minute, is that even allowed? Okay, Wayne Hill, thank you. I'm not going to name the place, but it, it is on the Facebook page. And you've got your own version of wood smoke wafting from a cabin chimney. Yeah, I love that look. That, again, that's one of those places that is very special to so many people, as is Aaron Hicks. Old tote road, grown over now, covered in dead leaves, beautiful popple sort of cover in northern Minnesota. The leaves are changing color. To me, at least, they look mostly golden, and there's a nice, easy walking path while the dog does all the heavy lifting in the, you know, arm diameter popple that's growing on both sides of that thing. Dick Martinson, I think I've been there. That looks like I could have taken that shot from a distance as well. Back of the pickup truck with a white dog in the foreground, probably a setter from what I can tell. Big blue sky and just flat, grassy Hungarian partridge country. Mike Hamilton, thank you. I know that spot. I know that road on the other side of that canyon. Yeah, you're in Chucker country and it's not too far from here. Thanks again for sharing that. I got to get back there this year. It's a steep slope on both sides. Whoever's standing in the photo there is probably catching their breath. The opposite side, you can see forever. And finally, uh, Ken Matye, I think that's how I say it. This is a sunrise or a sunset over some duck decoys framed by some rushes in the front. The reflection on the duck pond and hopefully one more crack at a bunch of those mallards that they go, take them! Love it all, everybody. Keep up the good work. Thanks for sharing some of your special places with us. And let me remind you that the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by the Ringneck Nation of Huron, South Dakota. Yeah, I'll see you there. Learn more about that at furfeathersfriends.com. But learn more about the 124,000 acres of public access at hunthuronsd.com. Come for the Ringneck Festival and Bird Dog Challenge or just come for all the fun and all the access. I'll see you there in October, but you come anytime. Get all that information just by visiting HuntHuronSD.com. And with that, I'll thank you for uh, listening, for sharing the good news, hopefully. Hope you learned something. Hope you'll tell other people about it. And please leave a rating wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Scott Linden. Until next week, see you in the training field.